So we've been learning about the Cold War as one of the outcomes of World War II. Uh, last class, we talked about the Korean War, known as the Forgotten War. The next major event in the Cold War between the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, is the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that is what we're going to learn about today. We have two daily objectives. Number one, explain why Cuba became a Soviet Union client state. And number two, explain how the Cuban Missile Crisis ended. So in the 1950s, Cuba was technically a dictatorship. It pretended to be a democracy, but it was actually a dictatorship. A lot of Central and South American countries had this problem during the 20th century. Uh, Cuba was led by a dictator known as Batista. This is Batista over here on the right in a very nice military-type uniform. Um, Batista's government, so Cuba, was technically a client state of the United States of America, which means that Cuba does what the U.S. says it does in exchange for support. Now, Cuba back in the 50s was a very different place than Cuba today. Cuba was, if you think of Las Vegas, that was Cuba. So, basically, Cuba was the playground for America's rich. Prostitution, gambling, drugs, anything you could want, anything you wanted to do, all of the gangsters and the celebrities, when they went on vacation, they went to Cuba. And they went nuts. Now, Cuba is very close to the United States of America. It's about 90 miles from Florida. And that's kind of the big reason why this was the destination. All of these things would be illegal in the United States at the time. They weren't illegal in Cuba. Cuba's economy depended on America's rich coming down for vacation. This is a problem. So a guy by the name of Fidel Castro is going to lead the communist revolution in Cuba. Fidel Castro is seen here on the right smoking a Cuban cigar. He was a young lawyer, and he and a lot of the people in Cuba were tired of A, living under a dictatorship, and B, seeing rich, spoiled Americans come down and tear up their island. They were tired of starving while rich Americans ate cake. So in January 1959, with the support of the Cuban people, Castro successfully overthrows the old Cuban dictator Batista. One of the things Castro immediately does, he shuts down the big hotels. He shuts down gambling. He ends prostitution. He kicks out the drugs. He makes a lot of very positive social, uh, social decisions in Cuba that really help improve the country in the short term. What, the next thing he does is he's going to nationalize. So the, he's going to take control. The government is going to take, take control of U.S.-owned sugar mills and refineries. Cuba is a big sugar producer for the United States, or at least it was at the time. Um, Castro is going to take over all of those companies. That makes a lot of people in the United States very angry. In response, the United States government is going to embargo Cuba. Basically, an embargo means the United States is no longer going to trade with Cuba. All trade ceases. Castro needs support. Cuba's been growing sugar for forever. They don't even grow enough food to, to feed all of its citizens because for since since uh, since since Cuba was founded, it had been growing sugar. It had been a playground for the rich, so it needed support from somebody. And because Castro was a communist, because the communist revolution had been brought to Cuba, he turns to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union being the primary and first communist country in the world. The U.S. does not like this. Remember, containment and domino theory means that, according to the United States, Cuba becomes communist. Next thing you know, all of Central America will be communist. So the United States, uh, under the uh, w w with the help of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, begins to train anti-Castro Cuban exiles. A lot of people got kicked out of Cuba once Fidel Castro took power. April 1961, these exiles invaded Cuba. They land at what was called the Bay of Pigs. Now, the Bay of Pigs was a huge failure. And there's two reasons why the Bay of Pigs was a huge failure. 
a lot of the guys who a lot of the a lot of the exiles who were going back to Cuba to retake the island were hanging out at this bar in Mexico. And Fidel Castro, being a smart guy, has got spies at all of the big ports and all of the bars. And they're listening to what people are saying. And all of these exiles are hanging around the bar, getting ready to prepare, preparing for the invasion the next day, and they're drinking. They're afraid they may die the next day. So they want to have a little fun the night before their possible death. So they're drinking. Uh, they start talking. They start talking a little too loudly. Castro's spy who was in the bar goes over, starts buying him drinks, starts asking him questions. Next thing you know, the spy knows everything that is going to happen. He relays messages back to Cuba. Fidel Castro and the Cuban military sets up the Bay of Pigs, sets up machine guns, sets up tanks, goes ahead and zeroes their mortars. And as soon as the Cuban exiles land, they are mowed down. They knew they were coming. Second big problem for the Cuban exiles is that the United States Central Intelligence Agency had promised to provide air support, bombers, uh, strafing runs, that kind of thing. At the end of the day, they don't do that. So the exiles are mowed down as they're landing on the beach. The rest are captured by the Cuban military. The exiles are going to be killed via firing squad fairly, fairly soon after taking some very uh, humiliating pictures. This makes the United States look bad. Everybody knows the United States was trying to get Cuba to go back democratic or at least dictatorship, at least not communist. So it makes the United States look bad, and it pushes Cuba even closer to the Soviet Union. Cuba felt like if it did not have the support and the backing and the protection, of the Soviet Union, the United States would again and again and again try and take it over. This was not cool to Fidel Castro. So after the Bay of Pigs, the Soviet Union thought the United States would allow communist expansion into Latin America. Remember, the U.S. failed to provide the air support. So the Soviet Union believes, hey, if we can get away with it in Cuba, we can get away with it everywhere. So they start going to other Central and South American countries and trying to get communist revolutions in those places. The other thing they do in July 1962 is the Soviet Union begins building secret nuclear missile silos in Cuba. Now, why did the Soviet Union want to build nuclear missile silos in Cuba? Because remember, Cuba is very, very close to the United States of America. If they can put nuclear missile silos in Cuba, then the missiles in Cuba can hit almost the entire United States of America. This is terrifying for people in the United States. These nuclear weapon sites are discovered by a U.S. spy plane that flies over the island. Over here on the right, this picture is actually one of the pictures taken by the spy plane. And you can see they're identifying different things and what they are. And this is how they knew that they were nuclear missile silos being built in Cuba. John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, declares these missiles a threat to the United States of America. And they are a threat. They are an intentional threat. What they are saying is, we have missiles within range of your country, and we can mess with you at any point. The USA demands the removal of the missiles. Soviet Union says no. Cuba says no. You're going to have to deal with it, United States of America. This is unacceptable to John F. Kennedy and the U.S. government. The U.S. government declares a naval blockade of Cuba. They take ships, and they see Soviet ships coming, and whenever a Soviet ship comes, gets start getting close to Cuba, the U.S. ship gets gets in front of it and blocks it from moving forward. This is technically illegal, uh, according to the United Nations, but the U.S. does it anyway. And the reason they do it is to prevent the Soviet Union from bringing more missiles and materials to Cuba to finish construction of the missile sites. Now, this blockade angers the Soviet Union and Cuba very, very, very much, clearly. The world is on the brink of nuclear war. This is the closest we ever got as a country. People were freaking out because people knew what was going on. They were freaking out. They were running out. They were preparing their bomb shelters. They were preparing their basements. They were buying canned food. It was absolutely terrifying to citizens of the United States of America. In a last-ditch effort, the, United, the Soviet Union and the United States of America negotiate. 
What ends up happening is the United States of America agrees to remove nuclear missiles from Turkey. Uh, Turkey is the country where the Ottoman Empire used to be in charge during World War I. Uh, Turkey is very close to the Soviet Union at this point. So the USA agrees to remove nuclear missiles from Turkey. In exchange, the Soviet Union agrees to remove the missiles from Cuba. This prevents a nuclear war. Nuclear war was stopped thanks to the, the very time-consuming, very laborious, and very successful negotiations between the Soviet Union and the United States. Answer your two daily objectives.